Last time, we covered the physical traits of primates and the major evolutionary categories of living primate species. But primatology is more than just the biological study of primates, it is also the study of their behaviors. In this lecture, we'll look at the behavioral side of things. The study of primate behavior is largely grounded in the field of behavioral ecology. The study of the evolution of behavior emphasizing the role of ecological factors as agents of natural selection. A behavior is anything that an organism does that involves action in response to internal or external stimuli. Central to behavioral ecology is the recognition that behaviors are influenced by genes and certain behaviors can increase or decrease reproductive success. So natural selection can select for certain behaviors in a given environmental context. In other words, if we identify a certain behavior as widespread among individuals in a certain population, we can explain why it's widespread by identifying how that behavior increases the individual's reproductive success. As we're looking at primate behaviors and how they might be evolutionarily advantageous, I'm going to be noting parallels between human behaviors and primate behaviors. Don't take this the wrong way. I'm not calling people monkeys or saying that certain human behaviors are ape-like. But humans and non-human primates exist on a biological continuum, a spectrum of biological and behavioral traits that range from human on one end to radically non-human on the other. As we learn what we share in common with other primates, as well as what we do not share, we learn about ourselves and our place in the living world. Of course, the parts of that continuum that are closest to ourselves are going to be the most informative for us. Those species most closely related to humans also exhibit behaviors most similar to our own. And the behaviors of the great apes have been studied more closely than those of monkeys or other primates. Those more distant primates also show many of the same behaviors, but in more simplified or attenuated forms. So they're less relevant in an anthropology course. Throughout the rest of the lecture, ape behavior will be emphasized. So, in studying the behaviors of primates, we start with describing the basic outlines of their lives. Remember that one of the characteristics of primates in general was their tendency to be social animals, that is, to live in groups with other members of the same species. The most obvious place to start describing their behavior then is to describe which others and how many of them. This is called social structure, the composition, size, and sex ratio of a group of animals. I would especially emphasize the last part of the textbook's definition, that social structure guides individual interactions and social relationships. In primates, a whole variety of factors influence the social structure of a particular primate species. Most of them are directly related to diet and nutritional requirements, uh, protection from predators, and dispersal, or how animals seek mates outside their birth groups. The same factors affect human social structures, but when we're talking about human societies, we call them subsistence, security, and marriage customs. Within most primate groups, social relationships play out within a dominance hierarchy a system of social organization wherein individuals within a group are ranked relative to one another. Higher ranking individuals generally get the first access to food supplies, more chances at mating, and so on. They're also able to exclude lower ranking individuals from doing what they would like to do, which is eat first. Generally, males are dominant to females, but in some species of non-human primate, the two sexes may also have parallel non-overlapping hierarchies. In a few cases, females are dominant to males. All human societies have a similar ranking system, though it varies greatly depending on how much influence the system has and how one gets to be high ranking. In primates, dominance is analogous to power in humans, and the dominance hierarchy is analogous to a political structure. One of the main reasons that humans can be as successful as we are is our highly developed system of communication, spoken language, which we'll look at a bit more at the end of the lecture. But for now, let's look at the communication systems used by primates in the wild. 
Communication consists of any act that conveys information in the form of a message to another individual. As your book points out, it can be voluntary or not, and all animals do it to a certain extent. Most primate communication takes the form of facial expressions, body language, and so on, and is probably unconscious, if not involuntary. Primates also use more complex voluntary forms of communication, of course, as this photo illustrates. One of the most well-studied forms of voluntary communication among primates are vocalizations, analogous to human language in some ways. A classic example of this is the chimpanzee's pant hoot, a versatile vocalization that can be used to greet other chimps, indicate excitement or agitation, or communicate other complex information. Let's listen. Another common form of communication among primates is the display, a sequence of repetitious behavior that serves to communicate an emotional state. Among non-human primates, displays are often communicating anger or aggression. The familiar image of a gorilla beating its chest is an aggressive display, as is chimps running in circles, tossing leaves, screaming, and dragging branches. So, when primates are interacting with one another, their actions can either be aggressive or affiliative. Aggressive actions, obviously, are against one another, and affiliative actions reinforce social bonds and promote group cohesion. We'll look at aggression first, then affiliation. The role of aggression in primate, and especially in ape, behavior has long been the subject of debate. One of the first paleoanthropologists in the early 20th century, Raymond Dart, popularized the notion of the savage ape and thought that much of human evolution was driven by violence and aggression. Michael Crichton wrote the novel Congo about a fictional species of savage, violent apes, and Stanley Kubrick's movie 2001 attributed human evolution to aggression. Then, following the work of Jane Goodall with chimps in the 1960s, Professionals for a while believed that apes were generally pretty non-aggressive, and it was only the interference of humans that caused aberrant, aggressive behavior. Today, we know that aggression has its place in naturally occurring wild primate and ape behavior. Within groups, aggression is often limited to displays and mild fighting because the dominance hierarchy provides an easily established solution to disputes. Lower ranking individuals lose, higher ranking individuals win. Between groups though, aggression resulting in serious harm to one or more individuals is not uncommon. Primate groups, especially ape troops, are territorial animals. A troop maintains a home range through which it claims the right to move and in which it stays permanently. Within the home range is a smaller area called a core area which contains the highest concentration and most reliable supplies of food and water. It is the core area that is actively defended against encroachment by other troops. When home ranges overlap and two troops encounter one another in that overlap, there may or may not be violence, depending on what sort of mood the animals are in at the moment. On the other hand, foreign troops that encroach on another troop's core area will encounter much more violent attacks. Chimps have even been known to collectively patrol the periphery of their own territory, hunting down and cooperatively attacking intruders from other groups. Your textbook gives several examples of such territorial aggression. How this differs in substance from human warfare and borders is beyond me. In contrast, Interactions between members of the same troop are more often affiliative than aggressive. 
These behaviors are those that put individuals at ease with one another and promote the smooth operation of the group's activities. Any species that lives in social groups must have some capacity for empathy, the ability to identify the feelings and thoughts of another individual. Such a capability is the only way that two animals can live together productively. Your textbook authors are a bit wishy-washy on whether non-human primates have empathy because they inaccurately equate empathy with compassion, the desire to change the feelings and thoughts of others so that they feel comfortable or content. Compassion is a much more complex form of thinking than empathy. Empathy simply involves an awareness of the internal states of others. Compassion involves that same awareness coupled with a preference that others exist in a particular state, an awareness that one's own actions can affect the other state, and a motivation to act to have that effect. It isn't necessarily clear that non-human primates have that level of mental function, though some primatologists think they do. Others criticize, and they say that attributing compassion to non-human primates is an act of anthropomorphizing, that is, giving human characteristics to animals when those characteristics are not actually present. What we see as acts of compassion may just be the animals treating sick or injured animals normally. For example, on page 171, your book recounts a story told by Jane Goodall about the chimps she studied. Big B, a middle-aged female chimp, had been severely injured. While she lay dying, her adolescent daughter, Little B, brought her food. Goodall interpreted this as an act of compassion, a desire on Little B's part to ease the suffering of her mother. But food sharing is a common behavior among healthy chimps under normal circumstances. It's possible that Little B was simply treating her mother the same way she'd treat her on any other day, regardless of Big B's condition. One of the most common affiliative behaviors among almost all primate species is social grooming. Social grooming consists of one animal picking through the fur of another to remove dirt, parasites, and any other materials that may be present. Grooming and other kinds of physical contact between two individuals show that the individuals trust one another, not just to one another, but to any others watching. This helps to strengthen networks of trust within the troop. In apes and some monkey species, close relationships that are essentially lifelong friendships sometimes form between individuals who are often of similar age, sex, and level in the dominance hierarchy. Primatologists, in an attempt not to anthropomorphize these apes, often call these relationships coalitions or alliances, but I see no reason not to call them friendships. The underlying evolutionary principle used to explain all these affiliative behaviors is that reproductive success of everyone increases if the troop can avoid aggression and competition among its members. Most affiliative behaviors, though, involve actions that benefit another individual, but at some potential risk or cost to the animal performing the action. This is called altruism. On the face of it, altruism would seem to be a maladaptive strategy. Isn't natural selection about one's own success, not the success of others? But since altruism is widespread among many species, we know that it must have been selected for. So how can we resolve this apparent contradiction? Some believe that natural selection should not be understood as involving the success of the individual, but the success of the gene. Any behavior that promotes the survival of the gene into the next generation, even if it's not passed on by that individual, will be selected for. So, since most members of a primate group are closely related and share many genes, altruistic behaviors that promote the survival of others actually promote the survival of one's own genes, just indirectly. Another explanation is reciprocity, the idea that current altruistic actions will be returned in the future. That is, I scratch your back and you scratch mine. 
This is, not surprisingly, the same principle that underlies many human economies. So let's look at mating now, since reproduction is the central behavior of relevance to natural selection. Your textbook describes a variety of factors surrounding reproductive behaviors that we don't have time to explore in detail during lecture. But be sure to read this section carefully and know it for the exam. Right now, let's look at the net effect of all those factors and examine some of the patterns that emerge in primate mating. Among primates, selective pressures drive many species to polygyny. Polygyny, among primates, is a mating system in which males have several mating partners and females only occasionally mate with more than one male. Males in polygynous species, like gorillas, compete to create harems of multiple female mates who mate only with them. Interestingly, most human societies allow a man to have more than one wife, which is the definition of polygyny among humans. Other strategies found in primates are also present among humans. Monogamy is a pattern where a single male-female pair mate and form an enduring bond to raise young. This pattern is most common among species that typically do not form large social groups. Typically, the largest groups among monogamous species, like gibbons, will be nuclear families. Another mating strategy found among a few species of monkeys is polyandry, where a single female mates with multiple males. Polyandry is extremely rare, both among human societies and among primates. Most human and primate societies are polygynous, which may explain why some primate males practice infanticide. Suppose a polygynous troop has a shakeup in its dominance hierarchy. The dominant male dies or loses his place to a younger, stronger male. That male then takes over the reproductive dominance with the right to mate with many of the females. But some of them already have nursing offspring and aren't able to reproduce again right away. Baboons, langurs, chimps, and various other species have been seen to go around and pick out the young offspring of the last dominant male, then kill them. This frees the females up for mating much sooner than they would otherwise be. Now the comparisons with human behavior are uncomfortable here. Step parents have a reputation surely undeserved, for being especially harsh to their stepchildren, perhaps for similar reasons. And the first thing that a new king often does is imprison or execute the children of his predecessor. All these primate behaviors may have some genetic component. Let's switch gears and look at culture, or at least the primate analogs of human culture. Recall the culture is a set of learned behaviors transmitted from one generation to the next by non-biological means, and it serves as a non-biological means of adapting to or changing the environment. A lot of these behaviors will involve tool use, the use of some object to accomplish a task more efficiently than the animal could alone. Here, we see a young female orangutan using a long stick as a fishing spear. At one time, tool use was considered an absolutely unique characteristic of human beings. We've since witnessed simple tool use in a variety of animals, some quite distant from humans like crows. Among primates, the first example of cultural behavior and tool use was witnessed in Japanese macaques in 1953. Researchers left sweet potatoes out to lure the monkeys in to where they could be observed but the sweet potato sat on muddy ground and got dirty. So one monkey named Emo washed hers in a stream before eating it. Others eventually started doing the same and even taught one another how to do it. Now there's a whole cultural tradition of washing sweet potatoes in that particular monkey troop. Among apes, the most prolific tool users and therefore the apes with the most discernible culture are chimpanzees. Chimps have been seen termite fishing with specially made sticks, hunting with custom made spears, albeit spears that just consist of sticks broken to a sharp edge. They've also been seen using hammer and anvil techniques to crack nuts, 
and so on. The important thing about these tools is that they're made especially for the purpose, modified by the chimps, and sometimes even made before their immediate use. That is, they're put aside for planned future uses. This shows that chimpanzees have some sense of a future, and they plan ahead and prepare for it. Perhaps more importantly, chimps teach each other and their young to make and use these tools in the wild. And those young, when they grow to adults, teach their own young. That transgenerational behavior makes this as much culture as anything humans do. Different troops of chimps even have different sets of tools. They have different cultural traditions. The last topic I'll cover in this lecture is language, and I'm just going to touch on it briefly. Language, as defined by your textbook, is a standardized system of arbitrary vocal sounds, written symbols, or gestures used in communication. I would add to that the requirement that true language is capable of communicating about potential or unreal circumstances and sending novel messages. Without those last ideas, some non-human primate communication systems may approach the idea of language. For example, your textbook discusses vervet monkeys who have a different alarm call for eagles than they do for leopards, and they know which is which. But the monkeys never make that call when those animals aren't physically present. Since they can't talk about the abstract concept of eagle, or the future or the past, they don't use true language in the sense that humans do. In the laboratory, on the other hand, some apes have shown the ability to learn human sign language and apply it in abstract ways. Apes like the chimp Washo or the gorilla Coco both learned American Sign Language and used it in ways comparable to human learners. Coco was said to have the same grasp of language as a three-year-old human. But these are only laboratory behaviors, and though some lab apes have taught signs to other apes in the labs, that kind of complex language has never been seen in the wild. So while apes may have some capacity for true language, it's certainly a very different capacity than in humans. That may be the only thing in this lecture that truly sets us apart from our primate cousins, and it's a difference of degree, not of kind. Conclusions like that, of course, are why we study primatology in an anthropology course. Keep that in mind as you begin studying for your second exam.